Fusarium root rot in for the peas, a lot of history of that. And we just wanted to see if we could get any inhibition of that root rot. Um, we chose the clear field technology so we'd have the option, like Justin pointed out, of, of using either Raptor or Beyond. We didn't put any fertilizer with this. And we ended up just using grass herbicide only. We didn't use the Raptor. So on uh, 13th of June, we had a pretty nasty hailstorm. This was the south end of the field. <clears throat> And it was 90 mile an hour winds and tennis ball size hail, and it really cut things off. But being cool season crops, the, the growing point hadn't emerged from the soil yet. And so by the 4th of July, this is about what it looked like. It was really coming back nicely. The moisture that we had gotten uh, with the hailstorm really uh, helped to advance the crop. And by late summer, um, we had really what I thought was a pretty decent looking crop coming. What we were noticing was there were more peas on the hilltops, a little lighter soil where the canola doesn't do as well. And down in the lower ground, uh, wetter and prone to saline, we had more canola taking over in those spots. Um, so when harvest came, we noticed that this, it was high line yellows is, was our, our pea uh, cultivar. And they were maturing way ahead of this clear field canola. We, um, we could see that was happening. So we did go out and we desiccated with a quarter roundup. Took a while to get everything dried down. And by the time we went out there, you can see the peas are pretty crispy. And in fact, <clears throat> when you look behind the header, you could see there was uh, quite a number of, of peas out there. We felt it was probably seven or eight bushel an acre. So, um, uh, you know, it was overall, we were, we were pleased with the bushels we got, but we felt we could have done better. That's what the, the mix looked like. Um, in this instance, uh, by weight, it was uh, two thirds peas and a third canola. And so we stuck it in the bin this way. We didn't have you know, our cleaning operation set up. We had plans to do it later on. We were concerned that if the peas were 14 moisture and the canola was nine or 10 moisture, was it all going to turn into a um, uh, 12 moisture where the canola was molding? But that didn't happen. Um, we, were, we were happy with the way it stored. And in fact, uh, we didn't get around to cleaning it for about a year and a half. And it came out of the bin just as nice as it went in. So we were pleased with that. So that year also, we tried uh, chickpeas and flax seeded with the same drill. So they, they went in one inch deep um, together. We had put on too much seed. We ended up doing 150 pounds and that was too heavy uh, on the chickpea seed. And we did about 12 pounds of flax and that was too little. So um, uh, we didn't use any fertilizer and no fungicide. And really that whole summer, we, we didn't see any ascochyta that we knew about. This was the same timing the field got hailed on. You can see the line between the two fields. And this was 4th of July, same way it was coming back very nicely. And by late summer, um, the, the flax had a lot of bowls on it and a lot of pods on the, um, on the chickpeas. When harvest time came, we, we wanted to, they were drying down pretty well together. We decided to desiccate them also with a quarter roundup and used a draper header to cut them. It cut similar to what soybeans would. The one thing we didn't like was the residue distribution. You can sort of see it up in the upper right corner up there. When you put that much flax through your combine, it's just not gonna chop and spread as nicely. So we felt maybe in uh, subsequent years, we would consider using a stripper head instead. Um, that first year, we really felt that was our best fit comparing it to the Piola, and we were pretty excited about it. Uh, that's what our sample looked in the, in the hopper. Um, 
I don't remember exactly. I want to say it was uh, 60% by weight chickpeas and 40 flax. You can see there were a few unthreshed balls in there, but overall it, it really worked nicely together. So then moving forward to 2019, because of the shattering and the yellow peas with the Clearfield canola, we switched to maple peas. And maple peas are a longer vined uh, type of pea, full season. Um, they typically, if you grow them by themselves, they'll get maybe three and a half feet tall. And just about a week before you harvest them, they all go flat and you get to put all of that through the combine. So we were kind of excited to see how that was gonna work out. Uh, we did try some different seeding rates. We did three different trials. We tried 120 pounds and 110 pounds and 100 pounds of maple peas, all with two and a half pounds of Clearfield canola. We also tried uh, some trials with 25 pounds of AMS, ammonium sulfate. Uh, didn't see any noticeable differences there. Um, 2019 was one of those years that was a dry start. The spring and the, um, the early summer were quite dry, but by the 1st of July, it started raining and that continued on in to harvest like a lot of you had, but it, they really, you know, they filled in nicely and um, was kind of a, a jungle out there in places. And by harvest time, um, you can see we had some weeds out there, but we also noticed that the, um, the canola still didn't quite mature as early as what the peas did. So, you know, between rainstorms, we felt we better hurry up and get these off before we lost them. So we did desiccate with Reglone, which is a lot like Gramoxone. It's, uh, it's, it's Diquat versus Paraquat. And um, we got a, a pretty fast burn down on that. And, um, you know, we had, we had some struggles with it. You can see the, that the stems of the uh, canola plants were pretty green, but um, overall we, we got through it. Um, we also tried some, um, some yellow peas with canola. Actually, I should back up. This was part of the um, population trial the strip that you can see down the middle that's lodged so bad, that was 120 pounds of maple peas. And as you go to the left of that, that was 110. And we came to the realization we really didn't need that many maple peas in that mixture. It's a smaller seed. So um, we had also tried some yellow peas with the canola. And once again, we had just too much shatter on the yellows. But we also did try some yellow peas by themselves. And once again, this was a field that had some history of root rot in it. And we had grown peas too many times over the years. And um, uh, those peas by themselves were just loaded with root rot and uh, really were quite poor. So that year also, we did, uh, oh, I just wanted to, to say when we harvested the uh, maple peas and canola, we tried one round with a stripper head, but we felt we were shattering too much of the canola. So we did end up doing the majority of it or the rest of it with a draper head. So that year also we did um, try some more chickpea and flax. That was what we were most excited <laughs> about. And we backed off that chickpea rate to about 120 pounds and we increased the flax up to 15 pounds. We had some weeds in spots, but um, it wasn't uh, uh, too bad. Um, but once again, we had that prolonged wet spell at harvest time. And these two, they're both indeterminate type crops and with the cooler weather and the the, the moisture that we got, they just wouldn't dry down. Eventually the chickpeas started to shatter and there was green mold, moldy seeds and black moldy seeds. And so it was getting to be go time. It was the 1st of October. And we just decided we'd go out with a stripper head and just salvage what flax that we could off of that. 
But what I was amazed, we got a few chickpeas in there, but um, it was primarily flax. But what amazed me was that off of 15 pounds of, of flax seed, we ended up with about 13 bushel of the acre flax. And adjacent to that, we had some flax by itself seeded at a full rate of maybe 48 or 50 pounds. And that only yielded like 22. It was one of those years that wasn't a great one for the flax, but I was, I was impressed with what 15 pounds of seed could do for us. So in 2020, we switched it up again. Uh, we just wanted to get that maturity timing figured out. So we switched over to yellow mustard and maple pea. And uh, we backed our seeding rate on the, on the maples off to 90 pounds. And we put in a half rate of, of mustard, five pounds. We felt that was a pretty nice match. Um, it, uh, they really do a nice job of flowering at the same time. They attract a lot of bees uh, into a mix like that. And they trellis together quite nicely. So uh, we were pretty happy with the way they were looking until uh, an August 2nd hailstorm. And it wasn't, uh, I mean, I've had worse hailstorms that have come through, but you can see there's a lot of mustard on the ground. There's some peas on the ground. It didn't get all of them. You can see there were, were certain clusters that were greener. So we still had some production there. So seeing as how we had already lost some to hail, we decided to use the stripper head and we were pretty happy with that. We, you know, it was tough to tell if we were losing any more after the header had gone by from what the hailstorm had done. But um, at least we were able to get the material through the combine, move a little faster. And we were leaving uh, a foot or better, maybe, maybe even um, 16, 18 inches of, of stubble out there to catch snow and uh, help with erosion and those kinds of things. I was amazed at how many, uh, pheasants were out in the uh in that field and this little guy jumped on and rode for a couple rounds um i finally had to get off onto the platform and just pick him up and throw him out and he takes off flying and he just he lands about 10 feet from a hawk that was sitting out there and i'm just going man you can't fix stupid <laughs> hawk like me though he got dinner so um we also tried with the mustard, we tried some yellow peas and that's a pretty good fit also. Um, the peas still dried down a little bit ahead of the mustard, but we didn't dare to use the stripper header on that. We used the draper. And um, uh, I think that's something that I'll probably try again. Um, most of the time, the maple peas carry a, a higher uh, value than, than the yellows, but this year it's gone the other way. Actually, the yellows are, are worth more than the maples. So after the uh, uh, chickpea and flax mess the year before, we, we decided we'd try lentils and flax. I had seen a neighbor, or a couple of neighbors that have been trying this and they've been pretty successful with it. I thought I'd give that a try. We, uh, we used 60 pounds of large lentils and 12 pounds of uh, flax. We had a lot of weeds in it, um, except for we had one, done one strip of fall vallum. We had actually intended to plant soybeans on that, but um, that's the strip off to the right. And that did a nice job on the weeds, but it thinned out the flax uh, quite a bit. So I don't know if backing off from three ounces to two ounces would be, a better idea or just increasing the flax rate to, um, to, to help some of that thinning. Um, we still had disease. Um, uh, Audrey's team had come out and scouted that field and let me know, I, I believe it was a phantomyces that, that we had in that field. And um, um, it was very poor. We, we ended up cutting it with a stripper header, just felt if we can leave as much of that residue upright again to catch snow and, and keep from getting any erosion. We were, we were ahead. There was, you know, the, the lentils we did get were pretty beat up and, and uh, uh, we haven't gone back to that one since. So in 2021, 
we stayed with a maple pea and mustard. Um, this went on an oats field. The, the oats had been hit by that same hailstorm that got us on the, on the maple pea mustard field. So we had a lot of volunteer oats in it. Um, we had to use uh, two grass applications as summer went on. We just keep getting new flushes and we still ended up with some oats in it um, um, at harvest time. Uh, we were fortunate this last summer. We had uh, one really good rain, but we did have a lot of, a lot of hot weather with it. Uh, this was up along the north end of the field along the road east of our house. Um, we had some flea beetle damage. And they probably worked their way out maybe 60 feet or so into the field. But uh, what I like about uh, an intercrop is had this been just uh, mustard or canola on its own, that kind of flea beetle pressure would have been huge. Uh, at least we had the peas to take over. It would have been bare ground and weeds uh, if it hadn't been for the, the peas taking over in that area. Um, so as summer went on, they grew together quite nicely again. And um, when harvest time came, we decided again to try the stripper head and had pretty good luck with it uh, till we got into some, some greener areas. We switched and went and cut some other crops for three days. And when we came back, we had had some hot windy days and things were a little too crispy. We, we tried the stripper head again and we were just shattering too much of the peas and the mustard. So we ended up finishing with a draper head. Um, so we saw some really strange differences. Uh, this is the field east of the house. Uh, we hit a line, all of a sudden we went from between 40 and 50 bushels down into between 20 and 30 bushels. And we, we didn't quite understand what that was. Our seeding rate was the same. Our, Previous chemicals were the same. Uh, it had all been hailed out oats the year before. We, we were at a loss. I started looking back at cropping history and I came to the realization in 2013, we had seeded peas on the south field till we ran out. And on the north side of that, that had been flax. And so we were still seeing, and, and it, again, this was a field with a lot of history of root rot. So we were still seeing some of that root rot taking hold eight years later. So the mustard helps to inhibit uh, the root rot, but it, it isn't a cure-all. Um, and I question if maybe the canola has a stronger antifungal property than what the, the mustard does. But um, that was a little surprising to us. On the other quarter, um, we knew we were going to have an issue on the east. We could see it all summer. That was actually the strip where we had started in 2018. So we didn't get, give it a long enough break. So it isn't, again, you still need to keep your rotations in place. But uh, I think it, it does help having a brassica in with your inner crop. Um, this past year, we didn't try a flax intercrop with chickpeas or lentils or anything. We went into the spring terribly dry, like the rest of you. There is no crop insurance on these intercrops. I was pretty comfortable with the maple pea and mustard, but, I, but less so with, with the flax. So I did a, just a kind of a simple comparison, um, only using variable costs. I didn't use direct costs. Like, seeding or harvesting or, or land costs. But just a, a, a quick uh, breakdown, uh, we had about $8.75 into chemical, uh, about 35 into seed. Uh, we used 40 pounds of MAP and 105 of urea and $6 spreading charge uh, for a total of $77 of expense. Um, the income on that, uh, this was a field that we had probably two miles south of where we had the maple pea mustard. And um, it looked better all summer, but I think the heat affected it a lot worse than what I realized. Ended up 720 pounds. We had a 37 cent contract for a gross of 266 and our net income after variable was 189. Now on the intercrop, um, 
Again, we had a little more chemical bill there because we had to use two grass treatments on uh, those fields, a little higher seed cost. Um, uh, the inoculant, we, we have a cost there, but our fertilizer and spreading, zero. And then we feel about a $17 an acre separation cost for a total of 72, which is pretty similar to what the mustard was. But by the time we, we separated out 17 bushels of peas at $15 and 318 pounds of mustard at the 37 cents, it gave us uh, a quite a bit higher gross income and left us with uh, $300 uh, net after variable costs. So um, my neighbor, Morgan Jacobs, who's here, uh, was kind enough to share with me his breakdown. And, you know, we saw very similar results. Um, the, the total costs, he, he put in his combining and spraying and, and seeding cost, but, um, um, he, you know, it's still the, the, uh, the companion crop was the lower of the three and the gross income was the higher of the three. So, uh, one thing he did that I really like was he had put together a, uh, yield that it would take to equal what the intercrop has done. And in the case of the mustard, uh, he would have needed nearly 1500 pounds compared to the 950 that he got to equal the, the bottom line of, of the uh, intercrop. And with the maple peas, he was pretty close. He would only needed 37 versus the 35 that he got. But, um, you know, there are a lot of advantages to not having to uh, scrape the ground to get the peas. And, and that was talked about earlier. So, and of course, there's going to be advantages and disadvantages between the two. Um, I like the fact that it adds diversity in the same field every year. It uh, has that potential for a higher combined yield. Uh, we're reducing our fertilizer and chemical bills. And I, I truly believe that we are seeing a, uh, a disease reduction in, in, our, in our peas and, and in the chickpeas uh, in the, the years that we've done that. And of course the uh, disadvantages, we don't have uh, viable crop insurance. We could be taking hail insurance. I did get a quote on that, decided it was too expensive. Um, <clears throat> after three years, we might be able to get a written agreement from RMA. So we'll see if that comes out and see what value they give us and, and what the, the cost of that premium is. Of course, the timing of maturities, um, I've had to play with that a lot to get things um, to work out, but um, it is an issue. There's that need to separate. It's definitely an expense. I do have a uh, five tube uh, quick clean also, and I had planned on running the uh, maple peas and mustard through that. This year, we had a lot of dead grasshoppers in the sample. We had that load of oats that was in there. I just felt it was just a little too dirty. So uh, again, I hired uh, the neighbors who have a bench sieve mill to run it through uh, later on. And then of course, we're pretty limited on our herbicide options. Uh, Pre-plant is probably the best way to go if you're after broadleaf weeds. Fortunately, the intercrops that I've been using are, um, are grass tolerant. So we, we have that in our, in our tool belt at least. So I guess that's all I have. Um, did you want me to take a couple of questions or do you want to wait for the panel? Um, well, does anyone have any questions that would be specific for Greg? Because we're going to have a, a panel here next with, um, yeah, maybe we'll just go right into the panel, I think. Sure. Yeah, okay. So we'll, uh... oh, Audrey, there was one question online. For <laughs> okay, sure, okay. go ahead. Um, <clears throat> Sheldon asks, which canola variety did you use and is it a variety recommended for straight cutting? Um, it was Pioneer, let's see, ends in a 76, H76, does that sound right, Morgan? It really isn't a shatter tolerant um, uh, canola variety, uh, not, not like your invaders, but um, Again, the reason we went with the clear field variety was thinking if we needed to use the uh, Beyond or Raptor 
on uh, as a as a broad loop control. But you know, I, I think this could work really well if we could find an early enough seasoned shatter tolerant canola to do this with. I I'm still searching, but um, for the time being, there's been some nice contracts on yellow mustard, and I plan to do that again this year. <laughs>